Since its founding in 1870, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City has amassed the most impressive collection of art in the Western Hemisphere. The Met uh, has, under one roof, absolutely every civilization, every culture over 5,000 years of recorded history, and that is absolutely unique. The aura that is conveyed is one of majesty. Walk into that great hall with its flowers and people and high ceilings, and it's a monumental space. You know, it speaks of the ages. It is also dynamic, constantly enriching its collections. The permanent collection here is extraordinary. You come here, you don't see a painting by Ruben. You see a gallery full. You see early works and latest. You see the earliest and the latest. You, the visitor, may say, I don't see much in this. Well, that may very well be. There is no right and there is no wrong. And what the art museum does is it awakens in the visitor a sense of critical evaluation. In the 130 plus years of our history, the mission, the charter, the bylaws of the museum has scarcely changed. It remains to acquire, to preserve, to publish, and to make accessible the great art of the world. In 1870, this Roman sarcophagus was the very first object to enter the collections of New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. From there bloomed the Met's magnificent Greek and Roman department. Here, the ancient Mediterranean world comes alive in bronze, terracotta, jewelry, glass, and marble. The Jaharis Gallery paves the way. This wonderful vaulted uh, gallery uh, flooded with light where uh, from one moment of the day to the other, the sculpture changes as the light sculpts the sculptures. And it is the timelessness of Greek art and Roman art which I think encourages us to look at them over and over again. Like the image on this terracotta vase, attributed to the classical Greek painter Euphronius. Euphronius is arguably the most noble and the most accomplished of the early red figure painters. The way the composition is framed by two standing figures, the balance of the red and the black, and the beautiful use of ornament. The scene depicts the hero Sarpedan, being carried from the battlefield by the personifications of sleep and death. It is a noble, grand scene. The Greeks learned monumental sculpture, for the most part, from Egypt. The ancient Egyptian influence on Greek sculpture is evident in the rigid pose of early male figures known as kouroi, which often marked graves. And ours is one of the earliest to have survived in good condition and each generation shows the male figure in a more naturalistic portrayal. By the fifth century BC, Greek sculptors had perfected classical form. Here is the wounded warrior. It's a bold composition, figure in great action, and yet we know that he's about to collapse. Most Greek sculptures survive today through marble copies made by Roman artists. The Greek originals were bronze and were melted down or rusted away but the Romans were artists in their own right. This row of portrait busts represents 300 years of Roman sculpture, from the first century to the fourth. And you can in a way see the, the whole gamut of the Roman Empire on one fell swoop. So powerful is the classical tradition of Greece and Rome that for more than 2,000 years it has defined the Western view of beauty. This great 19th century work by Antonio Canova shows Perseus, son of Zeus, holding the head of Medusa, whose gaze could turn mortals to stone. The Perseus is one of the great sculptures of the neoclassical period, both in terms of its artistry and purity of line, and I think it holds a position of great honor and majesty in the middle of that court. Perseus is male, body beautiful from the Western point of view. Here is the Asian Indian ideal of female perfection. The shapely figure of the celestial dancing Devata is beautiful, though her contorted pose is utterly fantastic. Ancient Indian sculpture from the area now known as Pakistan reflects the definite influence of the West, most likely the result of Alexander the Great's conquests or first century trade with Rome. In striking contrast is the pure Indian aesthetic, developed around the fifth century during India's classical age. 
the Gupta period. The Gupta period is a period of transformation where finally Indian art really comes into its own. This Gupta Buddha is one of the great icons of Indian art. The nose like a parrot's beak, the eyebrows like an archer's bow, the folds of the robe, although you sense the body beneath, there's also this sense of this dematerialization that's going on in front of you. The unique artistic vocabulary of literary metaphors is fully realized in this superb bronze of the Hindu goddess Parvati. In this case, you'll notice the extremely narrow waist, which is likened to a damaru, a, a kind of an Indian drum that's, that is hourglass shaped. The breasts are like ripe melons. The head is like an egg. The left arm is like an elephant's trunk. There's almost no sign of the elbow. Not all sculpture at the Met is metal or stone. These three-dimensional treasures were sculpted from cloth. In the Met's Costume Institute, conservators care for a collection of clothing that spans seven centuries and five continents. What we do here is interpret uh, these objects as art. This is really, really typical of the 18th century where the interior... The Met's costume art collection contains nearly 80,000 individual pieces from fashionable dress and regional clothing to shoes, undergarments, and even buttons. And people are always really shocked because of the size, but at this time, men's buttons were enormous and they were really a large decorative element on a tailcoat. This row of 18th century court dresses is ready for inspection and conservation. This fabric alone was very, very costly. You can see all the gold and the silver. In the 18th century, there was a spectacular manifestation of women's dress called the panniered gown. We have an English court gown with the most extraordinary uh, elbow-shaped panniers. They stick straight out out of the side of the waist and drop straight down on either side. The Costume Institute at the Met seeks out masterworks of clothing and design that advance the art of fashion. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't also enjoy hearing someone say, I would never wear that, or I would love to wear that.